It's the Endo meeting on June 26th of 2024, and we have two topics on the agenda. Leo, please ask your question first. Sure. So it's quite a simple question. Um, should we be calling lockdown when we're bundling the lockdown shim, calling it at the beginning because um, it's available as a global and it could prevent a dodgy shim being created um, as far as I understand. So yeah, literally online two or three, like at the very beginning of the bundle.js file, which is the entry point of when we create it. So yeah, uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, so the reason we don't is we have, have don't need to. The reason that we should anyway is, yeah, why not? Cool. Oh, yeah, and the tests pass. I'm doing it just checking yeah. on the master branch. So cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the fact that uh, SAS is being imported there before bundling uh, kind of suggested that the intention was to also run it. Importing it prevents uh, bundling something that, contains a syntax error because <laughs> it's going to fail fast. And if lockdown fails, that might also be useful. I yeah, if, if we broke lockdown, it would be a good reason not to create a bundle. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, we haven't. It, it, so simply, we haven't because it isn't necessary. It also isn't harmful and maybe will be helpful. So let's PR is welcome. Um, um follow-up question uh leo is it working now because initially when we tried it wasn't oh yeah that's right um yeah i'm not so before we were in my branch where we were looking at a um hermes compatible shim to publish but um it's working now that i tried on a fresh um git clone master branch and just added lockdown so it's working now so okay. yeah, earlier was most likely due to a messy branch and um, with other work inside sounds good yeah yeah, it's a, it's it's in it is cool. It is meta circularly cool at this point that that script replaced a rollup. We were using rollup to do the same job in the distant past, now very distant. Not so far that ZB doesn't remember. I think you. You've um, no, I don't. I don't remember rollup being there. I my first interaction with how SES is built was already this bundler. Okay. Well, in any case, we were using rollup, but rollup is like one totally redundant with other functionality that exists in the same project, <laughs> but uh, also a, a, a liability. If rollup were compromised, it could compromise the session. So um, yeah, so we are reaching up the dependency tree to use the compartment mapper in order to build the session, which is extremely meta circular <laughs> um like the mechanism that we are using to confine to create a confined um the the, the, mo the module to program transform is both useful for confining a module and also it happens to be useful for creating uh uh creating a script out of a whole bunch of modules and then in and inlining the machinery that the compartment would do um so as soon as i got around to doing that we knocked rollout out and switched to using using the compartment mapper and at the time all we had to do for that was get the bundle.js to be compact to be able to make the ses shim which doesn't even require intercompartmental linkage it only needs a single compartment because all the code is in the ses package or at least it was at the time um and then zb does remember a pull request that made it so that bundle.js could handle intercompartmental linkage, which apparently was easier than I imagined it would be. Um, the, and now SES depends on um, the env options package. So not only, not only is it useful, but now it's necessary for, for bundle.js to have largely and thank you, ZB, for maintaining this invariant that bundle.js is now for the lar for the most part has for the most part parity with what can be imported with the uh, with uh, import archive and all that. We, like common JS, I I did not add that. That was you. <laughs> yeah, we could also consider another round of checking if we can make the resulting bundles smaller. 
almost certainly with a different bundle bundler mechanism entirely yeah with with less code reuse we could do better and we could we could recapitulate roll up really if we wanted to it was something i've just spotted do we still want npm creating um the bundle because we switched to yarn uh four right so i think cess is the last package with some npm run stuff still going on it is yeah with the prepare so uh when we're building the bundle we're still using npm but yeah it's not important right um i think that just needs to switch to yarn yeah. i don't even know what you're referring to but I, i'm sure that a pr would be welcome okay sure yeah just the npm um the cess script that does prepare which is building the bundle just that one building the we system. did look at a history of that because it's possible that it only exists so that it's possible to locally install from a folder using npm ah okay yeah, so we probably need to look at the comment that introduced it to figure out whether it should be yarn <laughs> or if this one is specifically for some npm use case yeah do you do, uh, leo do you want to share your screen yeah sure i'll uh, quickly do that um okay zoom share okay cool so yes um i was just talking about this um, larger font please uh, <laughs> yeah um enhance, enhance. Um, otherwise, yeah, we're using Yarn, right? And we switched to Yarn 4 um, recently. Ah. And... ah, okay. So there's an NPM run and an NPM run build. Otherwise, I think it's just CI. We're still doing some NPM run. So I don't know if we want to switch that to the Yarn as well. But that that this might this might be because Yarn intercepts some command names and not others. But I assume that there's an analogous Yarn run that is not intercepted. Yeah, in, oh, in yeah, any, it, it yeah. this this is not a thing that actually yeah a PR is welcome but this does not matter. <laughs> there's there's no there's no place where we can't rely on npm to do the job, uh, in this particular case. And in fact, maybe in the near future we would change that to node dash dash run. Since they have subsumed this feature into the platform. Oh, Sally mentioned a question. Oh no, a suggestion. Oh, damn. Yeah. It's just the npm exact path um, instead of uh, npm or yarn, switching it with the environment variable uh, and npm exact path. Huh. Yeah. Is yarn supporting that? Yeah. Uh, I I put hmm. run after it because it doesn't make sense if you run if your exact path is an npm. Uh, yeah. CLI and then it doesn't know how to run without run. So um yeah. So they, they have compatibility, even you know, if it's just to make it compatible with this point. Yeah, I yeah, this is this is beneath my care. Um, but um, I would accept a PR. Um okay, let's uh let's Chris. Um so first, ZB, you you implemented the import now stuff in CES Shim, right? Yep. So under what conditions does it call import now? Um. Okay. Am I gonna open it up quick enough? No, I'm gonna. Okay, I'm I'm doing it from memory. <clears throat> so. Um. Whenever import now is actually called on a compartment, uh, that's when uh, there's even a chance to call the import now hook, right? And so compartment import now uh, is currently only being used prominently uh, in the common JS implementation of compartment mapper. So in compartment mapper, uh, require uh, delegates getting the module namespace to compartment.import now. 
of that uh, of that module name or specifier. Um, and then if that module is already available in module map, uh, it's going to be returned before there is even a chance to call uh, import now hook. As far as I remember, I mean, I created a test for that, so it should be true. Um, and then the if it's not there, uh, it's uh, it's going to call the import now hook and expect it to synchronously return something that's defined. There's some sort of, um, I don't know, Boolean or function in there that it says like prefers, prefer implementation or select implementation or prefers something. Does this ring oh. a bell? Select yeah. implementation is is part of the trampoline mechanism for deciding whether to go down the uh, the import hook or the import now hook. Okay, um, not select implementation. The one I'm thinking of starts with prefers or prefer. Um... Uh, yeah, uh, so the way the selection works is you're being, uh, I, the okay the, the logic of loading modules uh accepts a function that is used to choose which implementation uh is going to be selected and it chooses either import hook or import now hook depending on your preference and the order of the arguments to that function is always the same and so uh, there are two functions there uh, when when this is being used uh, in the trampoline uh, wrapper. One of those is passing a function called prefer sync. Mm. And that is choosing, it is always returning one of the arguments. And the other, uh, the other top level setup passes a function called prefer async, and that function is always choosing the other one of the arguments. And so okay. this is a, a okay. way to pass both hooks, to, to have hooks that are called different things and to choose the right one uh, without putting the choice in the logic itself. Okay, I just wanted I to- Find it and bring it up on screen. Uh, not necessary, not necessary. I, I just wanted to uh, make sure my my assumptions on how this worked were correct. Yeah. So this, this is actually brings up an interesting topic that I, I if you may indulge a tangent, mm. the uh, so that so the the cascade it depends on whether you're entering from the synchronous import now or the asynchronous import. If you go down the path of the synchronous import now, it's going to first check the module map, then it will check the module map hook, and then it will check the import now hook. Whichever one produces a module descriptor first wins. If you go down the asynchronous path via dynamic import, then you're going down uh, the same module map with and failing that going to the module map hook and failing that going to the import hook, which is asynchronous and may return a promise. The This had, touches upon parity with XS. XS implements the module map. It does not implement the module map hook, but it does alternately use what it calls the load hook or the load now hook which we're going to rename to import now hook and import hook for parity. Um, the, but this raises a question it's like, do I ask the folks at Modable to implement the module map hook in order to have parity with the SES shim? And it occurred to me that that's a design mistake, that the SES shim has a design mistake there, that really what the, what the cascade ought to be, because the module map hook 
is identical to the load now hook in its behavior, except that the load now hook is ob obligated to throw an exception if it can't find the module, whereas the module map hook is obligated to return undefined if it can't find an entry, right? But the load now hook could return in defined, undefined, and that would be semantically identical provided that the compartment machinery elevates that undefined into an exception, which it has to, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it occurred to me that maybe what we need to do in the CES shim is for one, leave the module map hook as a, because it, as, as an error of <laughs> that we have to keep because of backward compatibility. But the idea, the idealization that, that I think that XS should implement that we should emulate in the CES shim is that in the synchronous case, we consult first the module map then the load now hook. And if those both return undefined, throw an exception. In the asynchronous case, we consult the module map, then the load now hook. And if it returns undefined, consult the load hook or the import hook, as it were, um, which is to say that the load, the import now hook would be consulted in both the synchronous and the asynchronous path through the import machinery so that if you did have a synchronous, if you did have some modules that could be obtained synchronously, that logic could be shared by both the, both the synchronous and the asynchronous code paths. And that would provide a better assurance that they would converge on the same module map, regardless of which order you did an asynchronous or a synchronous import. I just used a lot of words. Um, I don't see how this is uh, better for us, uh, at least right now. It is. It, I mean, so I understand what you described. I don't see how it's beneficial yet uh, it or is, appealing. So the reason why it's not beneficial appeal or appealing, I presume, is that it does not relieve the compartment mapper of an obligation to provide both an import, uh, both the import hook and the import now hook. Is that right? Like we would still need to provide both in most cases. There's two different things that are expected now from module map hook and import now hook. So module map hook is there to look up mm -hmm. uh, all of the modules that were um, that were already loaded in other compartments and wire that up based on uh, the linkage that compartment mapper did before mm -hmm. and then import now hook uh, is called when you're forced to load um, a package or so, sorry a module that is not yet there so if we consolidated them to one uh, we would have the lookup that um, module map hook is doing as a first step, which is fine. Uh, but then it's possible that the more optimal way to load something uh, is through import now, uh, sorry, to through import hook, not through import now hook. And import now hook is there to be the last resort if you're in a situation where import has to happen synchronously. You're calling import now and the implementation of that can be uh, inefficient, can introduce trade-offs and so on. In the current situation, we're in control of that. And we know that if import now hook is being called, uh, we have to go and use uh, read file sync uh, and a bunch of similar uh, a bunch of similar limitations uh, to 
fetch and return the module, to do our best to fetch and return the module, uh, which import hook has a nicer, uh, more flexible implementation for it. So the that, way we were considering, I don't know how far we're going to go with the usage of import now hook, but one of the options we were considering was to let import now hook be a fairly simple fallback where uh, if we can provide something easily, we do so. And if we can, because there's some more complex relationships in the dependency tree, we just uh, bail and let it fail to, to require. I see. Yeah, I think I get the case. This will, it will be interesting to see this play out with TC39 as well, since they will have they will be obligated to provide both import now hook and import hook on the module constructor handler. Um, yeah. I see a question from Saleh. Yeah, yeah, I was going to jump in and say uh, there is a, an implementation. I know it's for require, but I mean, if you have a hook, you can require and return what the hook, what 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 is returned, right? Um, so there's that implementation now in Node. With, which has very clear um, constraints on, yeah, you know, behavior-wise, um, that are also potentially a way to kind of make the case for parity across. Oh yes, yeah, I made the same observation. You're right on. Thanks. All right, yeah, I just just wanted to make sure um, it was brought up, and yeah, sorry if it derailed. No, 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 it's a good point. Uh, and if anyone hasn't heard already, Node, oh, I forgot what her name was. Uh, do you remember ZB? The Joy? Yeah, yeah Joy. Yeah, Joy put together uh, a feature for Node.js that is anal very spiritually analogous to the import now hook and really helps provide a motivating use case at TC39 for having one. In addition to XS already having an import now hook and their compartment implementation that they rely upon, um, yeah, yeah, the, yeah the, and that that yeah that story is fleshing out. It's also the case that deferred module export answers a whole bunch of questions about what we are, what kinds of shenanigans we're willing to engage in. It answers the question that we are at TC thirty nine willing and in, in, in we are willing to engage with. Uh, a module system that ex that evaluates another module's body on the stack of the evaluation of another's module body transitively, which previously had never occurred, and we and I was not sure we would be willing to do, because of that that like common JS has this. If you call require, it may or may not execute the body of that module on the on your stack, um, mm -hmm. which will affect your stack trace. And it will make it possible for you to observe which who your first dependent uh, module was. Not that anybody ever does this or relies on it, except for detecting whether you're the main entry point module. Um, but, <laughs> um, it wasn't clear to me that, that TC39 was going to be willing to admit that possibility into the language until deferred module export settled. And now it's clear that they will, which means that import now the gate is open for import now. What is less clear is whether the gate is open for an import now hook because on because a native implementation in that case would have would be obligated to support reentrance between the native stack frames and the JavaScript stack frames recursively, right? Because calling a dynamic import.now syntax would cause whatever you were importing could cause whatever you're importing to be executed on the stack at the point of import now, which could result in calling the import now hook of a virtual module on top of your native stack ad nauseum, native JavaScript, native JavaScript, native JavaScript. Now, XS has no problem with this. They do this. Whether the other engine implement implementers will be willing to engage in that is another question. And that is an existential threat to the existence of an import now hook. A uh, question here, um, uh, are you referring to uh, deferred module evaluation proposal? Like, it, I think it's called proposal defer import eval. Uh, yes, that yeah. is that is one of the things I've mentioned, yeah. 
Oh yeah, so I'm just gonna throw the link as well in the chat. I just wanted to make sure it's the correct yeah, one. And Chip, that advanced, it, did it not at the at the at the last plenary deferred module import? Yes. Yeah. So. Actually, uh, no. There was a there was a um, there was a thing that advanced, but. It says here that it's at 2.7. Okay. So it's at least at 2.7, <laughs> probably at 2.7. Yeah, no, I think th th there was, there was, I've always been a little fuzzy on this uh, import source stuff um, with the diff different phases. Um, and it was, I think the thing in advance was one of the other phases. Um, as I say, there was a thing in advance, and I'm not sure I pattern, you know, my I was only sort of half paying attention to what you said there because I was yeah. distracted by the yeah, there were there were a couple there are a couple of module proposals that were at TC39 last plenary. And I think that yeah. they progress. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think everything that attempted to advance succeeded in advancing. Uh there so might source, have been first phase imports are a different thing. Um yeah. also 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 a feature that greases the wheels for compartment. Yeah. 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 We we are getting a module source. Uh, we're, we're getting a module source constructor for JavaScript. That's that's the win. Yeah, that's a good, uh, big one, actually. Yeah. OK, so Chris, let's get back on to your, your dilemma. OK, then you're still so here. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. So hopefully I can explain this. Um, basically, once you start going down the, from what I can tell, you know, once you start going down the import now path, everything else. Wherever will it dominate your destiny? <laughs> right. Yeah. Everything else that, you know, you, you require B, B requires C, it'll all go down that path. All right. And so if we're thinking about policy, we're, we're, we're trying to say, okay, this module, module B, can is allowed to dynamically require things. Okay. Um, and so, great, that passes policy. But then we get to module C that B requires, and it goes down the exact same code path. And that code path is going to want to know if C is also allowed to dynamic require. And at this point, I, I start, I, I'm starting to ask myself, well, what does dynamic require mean? It's what we're, 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 we're talking about is we're just, we're synchronously importing something. So um, let me ask a question. Mm -hmm. Is there a distinction in policy between what can be statically and dynamically imported? Because the compartment mapper does not have such a distinction. That's a that's an open question. I was operating under the assumption that we wanted to place a restriction around this, but maybe that's not quite true. So what what I what I came to was if 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 this is the way it's going to operate, if if uh, module B imports module C by name, and module C is already in the compartment map because B is is good and it added C to its dependencies, um, but that was not like statically. Uh, you couldn't you couldn't figure that out just by by looking at the require. So maybe it put C into a, a variable or something and, and required that variable. Um, and that's what I think about when I think about dynamic require is we're requiring not, not a literal, we're re requiring some symbol or something, right? So um, yeah, so if you're, if you're there, like it's, uh, it's hard to say no to that essentially because it's all going to look the same. Because if it's in the module map, right, we we pull it out of there just like anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I and that seems to me like it, that would be fine. But I'm not like the 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 it was security expert, so I don't really know. 
You okay. Know? Well, you're becoming <laughs> one. <laughs> this is the path. The I, I too am not a security expert, but here I am. <laughs> the um the chip, are you a security expert? Can we rely on you to be the adult in the room? Those are two entirely different questions. <laughs> okay. I would not represent myself as a security expert. Wow. Um, there was a time when I might have, but I have since met other people who are so many tiers above me in that regard that I just don't even try. It's kind of like I used to represent myself as an expert on, on grammars and parsing, and then I met Waldemar. Yeah. I mean, the jury's it, it, still out on whether I'm a programmer at all, frankly. Yeah. It's been I've been wondering. <laughs> as far as as far as being the adult in the room, um um I, I can do that if you want. <laughs> I'm sure I'm but, sure it won't be necessary. Okay. Good. Okay. The uh okay, so Chris, I think that the answer I would give you is that dynamic require and static require should not be distinct for purposes of policy. If you can import, if you can import a dynamically or statically is, should be the same. Now, whether you can make it work with that constraint is another question that I don't know the answer to, but I suspect that you can. What, so for like the is absolute case, that's not appealing. So, so, so for one, I can tell you also that what you described about being dependent, like this cascade idea that you've been talking about, where if A imports B and B imports C, does the behavior of B imports C rely on policy for A importing B? The answer to that must be no, mm -hmm. because that's, that is dynamic scope and dynamic scope is unholy and should be shunned. Um, there's, there shouldn't be dependence. It, 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 the, the, the policy decision should be of whether B can import C must exist in the compartment of B and must be answered irrespective of the, of the policy for compartment A. Okay. So when we're talking then about like, what, what exactly do we want this policy Right now, it's just a flag. What do we want it to do? What can we, what behavior can we uh, restrict? What we can restrict is a, a, a package dynamically requiring an absolute path or like a relative path that lives outside of its compartment or something like that, right? Right. Um, and in, that case, in that case, it's a per compartment policy decision that you yes. say- in this, in this, you're in this compartment, and you are, and someone either dynamically imports or uses require, which is ultimately import now. Either case, like if if dynamic import were supported by our platform, and one day it will, it would be going down the same path as require, right? So, mm -hmm. the, so whatever decision we have has to work for both cases. In both cases, if that argument. Passes, it passes the is absolute check, you are falling through to the exit import hook immediately. And that is dependent on policy. Yes. Uh, I can offer a different perspective on the problem because as far as I remember, the decision to consider introducing a distinction between regular import and dynamic import uh, in the policy was an opportunistic one. Because at some point we decided we wanted to be able to fish out the allowed dynamic dependencies from the policy and use that information to <clears throat> prepare or reload some of the items. If that's not necessary, uh, the original idea behind having a distinction uh, is no longer there. So that distinction might not be uh, desired anymore. And then the only thing to consider is whether there's any difference 
in terms of security between a regular require and a dynamic require, in which case, as long as the policy has to specify what exactly you're allowed to dynamically require, whether it knows about the dynamic nature or not, it seems like there's no difference between dynamic and regular require or, or import. So I'm, we don't need that information. I, I think that's the case. But again, this is this is more the, the if there is a requirement to distinguish dynamic from static, it's coming from lava moat, and I don't know what it is. It was a conceptual uh, workaround <laughs> uh, for the situation where we had to put entries in the compartment map for things that we know from the policy that are allowed to be dynamically required, but were not discovered at the time of building the compartment map. I see. And in that case, they got folded into the compartment map at the time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Because once, once the policy gets folded into the compartment map, like which modules and which scopes are integrated into the into the compartment, then the distinction disappears, right? Yeah. Uh, so that would well, mean... except when you hit the exit module, right? Except when we don't know what what the hell you're trying to require. I mean, I think that there is a there is a distinction to be made there in terms of like. Yes, I think exit, that has security exit modules, right? Wait, exit modules are uh, built-ins, so there's a different part of the policy. No, it's it's not necessarily a built-in. It might be. I mean, but from I'm... perspective of uh, endo policy, if you if you hit an exit module, it's going to be looked up in the built-ins uh, field of the policy and not the packages field of the policy. Because exit modules are considered provided by the host environment. Uh, I mean, would it, would it make sense? So if, okay, so if I'm, um, if I'm package foo and I use no JIP build to load my, my native module, and I, I, I tell no drip build here, look in this directory, this is my directory, look in this directory and tell me which of these native modules I need to load based on the architecture uh, and platform. Uh, sorry, are we talking about native or built-in? Two different things. It's Exit different. modules are built-in modules. So not native modules. It's, an it's just an example. Like Okay. Anyway, just, just hear me out. ZB, okay, what, yeah, we'll what, I'm what I'm proposing, what I've proposed to Chris is that in the case where you have an absolute path to a native, a native add-on, um, that the, that, that has to fall through to the host. Right. Mm -hmm. with, well, with okay. So right now, anyway, I didn't quite understand that as how you just put it. I understood it as if there's an absolute path at all, then that we we like the easiest thing to do essentially is treat it like an exit module um, because we don't we we probably could do something like try to um, you know keep keep those absolute paths in memory and try to look up things and try to figure out if the absolute path is in a compartment that we know about. Um, but yeah. I, yeah, I don't know if we should do that or not. Well, we, we, so the, if an attacker were able to use an absolute path to import an arbitrary module any, anywhere on your operate, anywhere on your file system, that is that is a very broad authority that a that a that you would be I mean, that you would end, be endowing to a compartment and for a native and if if you have a compartment that closes over a native module add-on that isn't really a 
difference in the amount of authority that you're giving that compartment. <laughs> this is like you are you are allowing this package to execute arbitrary C code. And it doesn't really make much difference. It makes some, but not a lot of difference, whether that arbitrary C code comes from the same package or not. I do think that there should be a guardrail to make sure that if you are using this power, it comes from C code that you provided and that you're not reaching for C code outside of like, like a same origin policy for package. <laughs> that, that makes sense. And that could be just a prefix check is like, within this compartment, I do give you the, I am going to endow you with the right to execute native, to require a fully qualified path to a native module, but it must be in within inside of this file system prefix. That seems reasonable to me. However, expressing that absolute path in the compartment map or in policy is not going to happen. Yeah. So, so there has to be some, there would have to be some, we would, we'll have to do something clever. I don't know what. So if you, a blessing in this regard is that you are not trying to solve this case for archives. There is no way to solve this problem for an archived bundled application. There is. Well, you, you lose the association between, in the process of bundling, you lose the association between the bundle and the native module. Like the, the, you, you lose the, the, you lose the, the shared context of the full qualified path. Whereas with import location, you do not lose that import location uses the fully qualified mm -hmm. path as the name of the compartment. And yes, yeah, but uh, for that to work in both cases, all you need to do is have a um, entry in compartment map that represent uh, what Webpack calls context, but I think it's not a great name, uh, a um, directory path of the entry module as the prefix for every path considerable. And so if you're trying to uh, import an absolute path, it first, it has to begin with that specific uh, prefix. And then that prefix can be removed and that path can be considered as part of whatever we have in the compartment map. And in case of, um, archive, it's going to be a matter of also translating that path into uh, uh, through the same translator that we used before to create the keys in the archive compartment map. But that's a uh, that's what I that's what I would call an implementation detail. The information is there. It if could... you just save the prefix. Yeah, but the but the node built-in module is that there? Is that captured in the archive? Can can nodes import machinery import that module given that it's in a zip file and not on the disk? You mean a, a native? Yeah, yeah, a native. Module. Mm -hmm. Um, you would have we we would have to create a system where it actually got out from written out to a temporary location and then act on disk. I well, you would, uh, for native modules, you need a custom uh, parser anyway. And that custom parser is currently implemented to uh, load from disk, but it might as well load from uh, the blob that it's being given by compartment mapper. Uh, by the trick I already mentioned, and I'm again sorry for coming up with it, uh, saving that content to a file in a temporary directory and requiring it from that file. Well, in in let let me let me take a step back. We have no motivating use case for importing a native module from an archive. Yeah. We do have a motivating use case for importing a native module via import location, in which case the compartment name 
in, in which case the compartment map does contain enough information to reconstruct the prefix the, the prefix directory for for the compartment in question and could then check whether the fully qualified path mm -hmm. given require is a subpath of that. Okay, so if we do that, then do we need this this policy flag at all? Uh, which policy? Is it like the, so there the, if there is a policy flag, it's actually an enum, right? It's on the one hand, native modules are by default forbidden in all compart in all compartments. That's the basis. Mm -hmm. Level two, native add-ons can be imported as long as they come from the same package. And three, this package, this compartment may execute arbitrary code anywhere on the file system. And maybe we don't need that one. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think we do. <laughs> okay, so if the, so within so we so we if you could have a flag that says node add-ons unsafe node if you well, know. right right so uh i don't remember what pr it was but i added this options thing to the endo policy and we can just throw whatever we need in there to handle native modules and, and endo doesn't need to care about it okay and then we're responsible for for enforcing that policy. Ah, yes. Um, and so it's only one flag. And right now, the thing I'm working with is a flag just called dynamic. It's a boolean. I it's it's in it's right alongside no freezing whatever the hell the name of that one flag is called. It's right. It's a sibling to that. And I'm and I'm wondering now, do we need that if if we're saying okay, 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 you can absolutely require something. If you want, like, but it has to live in, in this. We do need a flag for that. We need, right? we need a, yeah, we don't need a dynamic flag. That cuts across the wrong axis. We do need a flag for whether native model, whether native add-ons are permitted. Yeah. But and, wait. And, and yeah, we, yeah, that's 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 the one. I think this is a, a little bit of a misunderstanding. So the uh the parser that we use to enable loading native modules uh, gets the policy of the current compartment as input. Uh, and in the policy, we have the options field uh, that contains a flag that says whether loading native stuff is allowed or not. And based on that, we decide whether uh, we want to allow uh, loading through that parser. Okay, executing through that parser uh, or throw an error. Right. right? So and now where yeah. does the, the absolute path uh, come in? If, if we get an absolute path as input, then we would need to look up whether that absolute path is uh, prefixed by the path to the current compartment. Yeah. If so, we're good. If not, it should be forbidden. But if it's, but if, but, but, but that would allow any package to require any other package, wouldn't it? Mm, any package? No, because it's only looked up in the, uh, in the native. There, there is a disconnection. Oh, okay. There's a disconnect here because, um, because in practice, if you're using NodeJip, the the module specifier that the dynamic require is going to use is going to be a fully qualified path that does not correspond to the module specifier of the add-on. And that, yes. so it does, it's not going, the absolute path isn't going to reach the policy enforcing parser for node add ons. Yeah, I realized that. So, the so either we exit to the host, in which case you're saying, I will, you may, you may execute any add on inside of the, that is underneath your package root, and our parser is uninvolved, or 
we create a mechanism where the module specifier gets inferred from the absolute path in order to return via the return to the compartments machinery for importing. I don't want to implement the latter, <laughs> but if I have to, I, I will. Um, uh, okay, let's let's look for some other options because I don't like both. <laughs> Sorry. I think it would be helpful to just forget about native modules because it doesn't have it really doesn't have anything to do with that. That's like a separate problem that that we've solved with with the the parser and the and the and the policy checking within it and all that stuff. It, okay. It's really so, about these absolute paths. So if you if you do so in the current system, if you statically import an add-on by its module specifier, the the parser is going to be used to enforce the policy, right? Mm -hmm. And it will be able to execute it, right? Yes, I mm -hmm. have tests that do this, yes. Yeah, okay. So this absolute path is just like, well, if it happened to use an absolute path, then none of that machinery works and it's completely irrelevant. Yes. Which, <laughs> which is not, which is, which is confusing, <laughs> at least. Okay, so we need to like the the happiest scenario I can come up with is we find a way to as early as possible take the absolute path, detect the fact that it's an absolute path, and resolve from that to what module it's pointing at. And if it's pointing at a module, so we need to do the opposite of resolve. Am I right? Okay. No, I know where you're going with this. Okay. Okay. And then we rewrite it to be a, a path that starts with a, a, a package yeah. name and then slash whatever path we want to dig into. The word you're looking for is relativize. Um, and relativize is the is the inverse of resolve and there is a rel i wrote a relativize function for module specifiers um in the compartment mapper you'll find it somewhere but that function operates on the domain of module specifiers not on the domain of absolute paths so first you <laughs> first you must get to a relative path, which means threading another power, because that's an because constructing a relative path from a pair of absolute paths is an operating system dependent power, a platform dependent power that'll have to be thre threaded through the node powers, and used only if it exists, only if only used only if it's provided. Um. Right next to your new is absolute power that you've threaded, Chris. Sorry. This all makes me very sad. We should be ashamed yeah. of ourselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, what else could we do about it? Can we have a uh, a single power for that that's a black box? and we can give it a thing and if it if that thing is a an absolute path it's going to transform it uh, into something that we can actually use get yeah this is essentially um, a function that is a black box that receives It receives the compartment's configuration so that it can know the fully qualified path of the package if the name of the package is the fully qualified path. Um, yeah, it needs to accept that and the given path or the given module specifier, which in and then return 
undefined usually, but if the specifier corresponds to an operating system dependent, fully absolute path, then produce the corresponding absolute or full module specifier in the context of that compartment. Yeah, that 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 is what you, yeah, that could be the path. If you wished to avoid threading all of the all of the necessary host dependent uh, platform dependent powers that is the function you would have to provide a hook for like given this compartment and this module specifier that might be an absolute path give me the corresponding compartment relative module specifier okay uh, i want to challenge the system the operating system dependency but let's hear from sally first yeah, I was going to jump in because um, something that helped a lot with um, logic for loaders with ESM was making everything a URL. And so that's when Node got the powers file path from or to URL, all these. Uh, it's a lot easier to write safe um, and reliable regular expression based um path manipulation functions for valid urls um as as the constraint of what you're dealing with and so if um offsetting making it os absolute uh is if you offset that all the way to just before the os called uh itself and you do everything else in url world um you could potentially avoid needing uh, special cases for different operating systems as powers um, only at the point where you are really deferring to the operating system um, a particular passing to an operating system the particular path uh, are you going to that native uh, representation of the path yeah yeah, that is that is part of the conversation that Chris and I have had. The compartment mapper already internally uses URLs for everything in order to be web and node portable. Um, yeah, and it's just it's just this this is just rough case that there are modules that logically are calling require with OS dependent absolute paths. And the, the, in the, the way you can, specifier. right and the way you convert those to URLs looks different depending on what operating system you're on. Uh, if that... Can you give me an example of uh, a path being OS dependent? Because I, I I can get it. C colon backslash foo. Yeah, is interpreted no. differently on Unix and Windows. So, so I guess the other tangent I was going to ask about is um, if that only happens in Node, or is that a um, multi-runtime scenario? Mm -hmm. Like, like does it happen in other places than Node, to where you where you get something that is literally passing a specifier that's an absolute path? The behavior, the behavior of um, so the URL constructor in Node URL parse cannot by itself behave identically on Windows and Unix. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. But they do have that power um, um, uh, URL. Uh, sorry, file path to URL or yes. something. Yeah, that power. That power is is threaded through the um, the file to path. Path to file URL power is is one of the optional powers that you can thread into the compartment mapper, right? And and so what I'm what my thinking is is if you can get that power and you only put it in the part that first gets the specifier from whatever is specifying it, and that makes it a URL, and then from from there on all your internal logic doesn't need that power, it already has been used because all specifiers are now URL. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you know that it's an absolute path, and it needs to be? You know what I mean? Because uh, it might, it might be, it it might be a um, a dynamic require for a built-in module. 
Right, right. So, so you have logic to determine whether or not it's a bare specifier versus an absolute path. So you, you would have that logic first at the specifier specified here function. Um, uh, and, and so you pass it the specifier and then you determine if it's a bare specifier or an absolute specifier right there. And if it's absolute, you convert it to a file URL with that power right there. And if it's a bare specifier, um, you just treat it as a bare specifier moving forward. Um, this is approximately, this is, this is very close to what I've proposed to Chris. Very, very close. What, what I, uh, first, first off, I, I always start this conversation with definitions of terminology because there isn't common agreement about what these names or things are named. Um, within the context of the compartment mapper design, I use the term relative specifier to indicate any specifier that is being interpreted in the context of a dynamic, of, of not of, of an import specifier path. And if it starts with dot slash or dot dot slash, then it is a relative specifier. Whereas, um, whereas a full specifier is the key in the module uh, in the module map of a compartment, and a full specifier may either be uh, begin with dot slash, which indicates that it's local to the package, or anything else which is not local to the package. And the anything else category falls into two categories. It falls into other categories, right? The it can be an absolute path, and I'm using absolute to mean the platform dependent absolute path, right? Yeah. yeah. Which can start, which can start with C colon, or it could start with forward slash. That's that's a different thing. It's not in the domain of module specifiers. That's in the domain of a host dependent path. Right. Uh, where and then there's also like node colon specifiers, which are like expressly built in mo expressly denoted uh, built in modules. Then there's file colon slash slash slash, which are fully qualified URL specifiers. And then uh, and then and then there's what I call an absolute. What I call, pardon, what I call a full specifier is is intercompartmental linkage. That's the class of everything else that doesn't that isn't one of those that implies a link to a package in another compartment. And those are really hard to distinguish from each other. I mean, if it starts with dot slash, so so the rule I proposed to to Chris was start with if it begins with dot slash, treat it as a uh, treat it as a package local specifier. Right. If it's anything else, treat it as if it were a URL. Or, or pardon, in the case of dynamic require, first run it through. Um, oh God, what did I propose, Chris? <laughs> um, I don't know, but but uh, require doesn't speak URLs. Right. So I I don't know. I, you may have suggested just just there was something where you said, oh, yeah, make a new URL and use the base as this compartment protocol that doesn't exist and, and something or other. Oh, that's right. I said I, I suggested resolving resolving the module specifier relative to compartment colon slash slash slash. And then um, and then. Uh, um, something about URLs, if you're using a non-standard prefix protocol, uh, resolution is broken. Um, and so so the hack to do there is to file URL it with a uh, ugly, uh, unlikely um, prefix root. Um, oh, goodness. Right, right. Yeah. Well, in any case, what what we what we figured out was that you have to you have to thread is absolute in because file uh, file path to file URL is not sufficient power to distinguish a fully qualified platform dependent path from a URL. It just can't do that. 
Um, so we would have to thread that power or a power that closes over that capability as ZB suggested in yeah. order to distinguish those cases. Yeah. Um, okay, there's still one open path that I don't know why uh, we would not take. And sorry if I'm repeating myself because I missed something, but uh, if we if we get a require with a specifier and that specifier happens to begin with a string that matches the location of uh, the current compartment in which the require is being called, we can replace that prefix with a dot and keep the rest of the implementation unchanged. What am I missing? We don't need to know anything about the operating system because we've already encoded the knowledge of the operating system in the prefixing path of the location. Oh, that's interesting. I don't understand that. What do you mean? So, so in the, uh, in the uh, compartment descriptors, you have the location for each compartment. Uh, and that location is already an absolute path. It's not a URL. Uh, right. um, I, I don't remember, but it's, it's an absolute path, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so if it's an absolute path, uh, the operating system part tends to be the beginning <laughs> of the path. So we already have that information encoded in there. So if you get a request to, to like load a specifier, uh, you can check if it's an exact match for the location for your current compartment. If it is, replace the matching part with a dot and continue. And I don't see why it wouldn't work unless we're using URLs, not paths for locations. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's... That's good too, right? But it, it still doesn't solve and the, the, the implementation. Issue. Yeah. Uh, well, what? Why? Because package A provides no JIT build with a, a absolute path to some directory within package A. And no JIT build looks for the appropriate file in that directory, and then it dynamically requires the file in that directory, which is not in node JIP builds compartment. Yeah. It's in package A's compartment. Uh, wait, node JIP build gets involved at the runtime? when we want to load the native module? Yes. Yeah, that's the way most, most native modules do things. Because the, the your native module is going to, that the file name is going to differ based on your platform and your architecture or what have you. And no JIT build helps figure out what the file name should be. Um, and all you do is you give it a directory to where those potential files might live and then no JIT build performs that dynamic require using an absolute path. And so no JIP build, package A wants no JIP build, no JIP build makes require back into package A using an absolute path. Uh, that's awful. Okay. <laughs> it is though. And it's common. Um, okay, I say back to the drawing board because uh, this specific case is not something we would want to allow because it means we would have to allow a specific package, no JIP build in this case, uh, to run native modules on behalf of someone else. Um, so node JIP build gets a uh, wildcard for everything. Uh, 
because it's one package in one compartment and we allow it to load everything. And then your policy, the way you specify that a, a package can load a native module in the policy would essentially be allowing it to import node.jib build. And then node.jib build is a special unicorn case uh, for which we have to allow loading absolutely everything. Which means we could use the functionality we are building anyway to select um, a package and declare that that package is going to run outside of lava mode and then have the permission for native stuff effectively be uh, the permission to import that package that allows loading native modules and having that package be outside of lava modes and potentially emulated instead. Yeah, this is a bad pattern. Why wouldn't it resolve things and give you back the thing you need to require? Why does it have to require for you? That's anti-object capability. Yeah, this is, it's like they made it work and added and left it to be somebody else's job to add security later. Uh, I mean, if I were going to write no JIP build, I'd probably write it the way it works. So the user wouldn't have to write two requires. Uh, but let's pretend I don't know what I know <laughs> now, you know? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, this is this smells like a case for power broker, but I didn't figure out how yet. Could I uh, could I just add one thing here um, that uh, you know um, when a specifier is an absolute OS specifier and it goes into that function that takes the specifier from other code um, and, and wraps it into what we represented internally. It could begin with absolute colon file, um, you know, uh, followed by the file URL um, completion for that. And, and so, so technically when you're doing URL based path uh, surgery, um, you're replacing absolute colon with file colon, and then restoring it back to absolute colon after you're done with the op. Um, and so internally, whatever you're representing is absolute colon is really a file URL for an absolute path distinct from a file URL that's a file URL um, that doesn't get the absolute colon um, uh, prefix because it was passed um, from user land code as a file URL specifier uh, to begin with. Um, so yeah, there there are there are ways where if if you put the logic that your internal specifiers are distinct but can be easily made into file URLs for ops, you know, for path ops like like resolution basically um um then then you're able to still distinguish um the specifiers and however those are represented back to the uh user land um side could be different from what you're doing internally um but you still hold the distinctions um but that will also mean that you'll have to be really clear for users what they're entering in their own um, policy uh, versus what you're doing internally. 
Um, so the internal specifiers may not be necessarily the ones you're using in the policies because those are user land specifiers. Uh, whereas the internal ones um, could be anything that you could convert to a file, file URL um, to easily, um, you know, um, resolve or use regular expressions to uh, relativize, I think. It still means we have to convert an absolute path that someone's giving us into a file URL before putting absolute colon in front. Right, right. But that means you're really using one op to make it into a file URL and you're tagging it so that you know it was absolute. And that means when it's being actually passed to the OS, um, also that's one point. Um, there you could actually then say if it's absolute colon, um, then it needs to be um, used with the reverse function, you know, uh, path from file URL or file URL to to path, I think. Um, and, and those are just two two functions that exist in Node, and equivalents for those could be used on other platforms if needed. Um, but but they give you two points where you're really just saying, you know. Um, absolute world, anything coming from, uh, you know, uh, user land um, could be tagged as absolute and treated as a uh, special file URL uh, for ops, like any other path that is not a, um, a bare specifier for notes terminology. Sorry for that. Um, no, good. Bare specifier is good. I'll re agree agree to use that going forward right and and then the other point is when it's being passed to the uh file ops basically that are os ops um that is where you're using the other function and those are only two points and everything else gives you a har harmonized simplified way to uh use the same resolution mechanisms um, resolve or relativize, I think. Um, um, now it all becomes um, just one set of, um, you know, uh, functions that don't require submodules like, um, you know, win 32 or, or <laughs> yeah. Mm. I mean, it, it, there is a, it, it does seem that there would be a, an opportunity to, to use something like that um, because the way it works now is, is just um, we get the thing and there's so, we get, the, we get the module specifier and there's so much code dedicated to figuring out what the hell to do with that based on how it looks. You know, if we could, if we could isolate that to, to a, you know, a thing and then and, and have our own interface for dealing with it. I don't know. But um that would I don't I don't know if that would end up helping us in the end. But um I'm, it's worth looking I'm into. struggling to I, I'm struggling to keep up because there's a second thread running uh about the situation where we have multiple packages call one shared package that they have to import, giving that package instructions on where to load native modules from. So how do we even thread those powers? Uh, we could... Uh, it's a matter of policy whether a module that has a native... I think that our, our choices are very limited by the shape of the code that we're that we're using, that I think that the only thing that works is endowing the node JIT with the authority to import anything on the file system, which we previously agreed was an authority that did not need to be expressed, but apparently does. Um, and then 
and then just limit access to importing node jip as the way that but that means anything that's allowed to import node jip uh, can get to run anything on yes. uh, the entire system which i don't like so yes. the but you've already decided to import a native module and all hope was already lost Yes, I, I want agree. to have some restrictions on what I could do. There. This is security so theater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have the, my coin on me. Um, no, I think I think the answer is that we need to give. Uh, so so the previous design that we discussed was. Uh, so we we've discussed just like well hey if they had done this properly they would do this with one they would. Um, what. They were if the if the, if if these packages that used native modules built into themselves had been designed with OCAPs in mind, what they would have done is make it so that you would consult the node JIP package to find the fully qualified path, or the uh, uh, yeah the fully qualified path of the node built in, and then return that to the package that needs to import it, and then it would import it, right? And mm -hmm. if that had been if 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 the package that had a built-in module were designed that way, then we could frame a policy saying this package may import built-ins that are inside of its own, are inside of its inside of its path prefix, and the and the node uh, and the add-on the the node JIP package would have no authority at all. It's just doing math, right? It's just doing path math based off of the parameters you gave it. So you could make the node. Is it so? In that you could make the, uh, you could have a package that has very little authority. Be a common dependency of all of these other packages that have node built-ins. And that use case, while it doesn't exist today, LavaMote should accommodate that, so that if you find a built-in module that is reaching for excess authority through the the node JIP package, you could ask the maintainers of that package to refactor it in a way that you could better confine it and then get that change upstream, yada, 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 and then apply your policy. So what I think the answer is that we have to provide both. One, for dealing with reality as it is, there's going to be excess authority for any package that currently uses no JIP for this. And also, here's an escape hatch. If you refactor it just this way, then we can create a more reasonable policy and we would be more um, then and we would be more delighted to depend on your built-in module. Okay. Um, some additions to that. Um, I think if we're implementing requiring absolute paths, at this point, I'm tempted. I, I don't know what to do with the beginning of the path <laughs> yet, but I'm tempted to force... Uh, listing those paths. So if you want to require absolute paths, these absolute paths have to be in your packages entry or a separate entry in the policy that allows getting those specific paths. Uh, and that would at least partially limit uh, what uh, the JIP package can do, although not by much. And then uh, it introduces the, the obvious uh, and unmitigated uh, confused deputy problem in there because anyone can ask for any of the paths. Uh, so, so, so what you're saying is that you would you, uh, you would include in your policy the ah ahs of all of the packages that contain native mod modules that any other package can import if it has access to node add-ons, right? I mean, I would limit what JIP can import and then uh, control who can import JIP, but that would still not be enough. So at this point, I'm tempted to uh, use attenuation to replace the node JIP package uh, with something that wraps node JIP package uh, and introduces custom enforcement that says uh, the whatever is requesting something, whatever is calling a function, uh, can only call a function with uh, input that 
has something to do with the location from which the calling code came from. This is actually, uh, here's, here's another idea to riff on, bearing in mind we're way over time and I apologize, it must be exceedingly late for you, Zibi. Um, almost, and I, you're in the same time zone, Leo, right? Uh, his time zone's even, uh, no, his time zone's uh, right. one hour, one hour less. less. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> in an, if, go, if we go an hour hour longer, then Leo will be in the situation if he's in right now. Anyhow, the um, another idea would be to create a replica of the no, the, the no jip compartment for every compartment that depends upon it, and then apply apply a, a, a limited depend a, a limit it to being able to um, import within the other packages prefix. Hey, if I create if a I want to mm -hmm. if I want to achieve the same but keep the policy as it used to be, I could load a separate copy of node jip into each compartment uh, that is allowed loading it. So mm -hmm. I don't know how we would wire it up in compartment mapper yet, but uh, conceptually loading node jip in the compartment instead of in a separate compartment, always loading it in the compartment of the thing brings us back to the original implementation that was allowing limiting what it can uh, natively require uh, or in general require as an absolute path to absolute paths beginning uh, with the location of the current compartment and air quotes. All we need to do <laughs> is figure out a way to load no JIP package or any predetermined package inside of the compartment that requests it instead of inside of the separate compartment that it wants to be in. And that would probably be a very clean carve out if we find the right place to do it. Well, I know that the compartment mapper will allow you to create a replica for any compartment sharing the same physical path. So that that part should be easy. You can the the compartment the 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 machinery that reads the full compartment map um, allows for the possibility that multiple compartments share the same physical location. But we don't want that. We want them to be separate compartments for each uh, package that has a native module. And then what we want is to not have a separate compartment for uh, the JIP package, but instead let it be considered uh, a thing that can be loaded into a compartment of whatever is importing it. I suppose I don't follow. Let's um, let's go async at this point. Sleep on it. Yeah. Maybe. Proposal. Can I ask one question before we leave? Uh, just um, mm -hmm. is there is there uh, ZB? Is there a representation of absolute paths in the policy somehow? Like, um, or, and my question here is, what what if that is happening? What is really being done about different platform? Uh, there is no concept of an absolute path or anything even resembling it uh, in the policy. Perfect. All right. Yeah, it's, it's just a point I needed to clarify. Thanks. Yeah. In instead of fully qualified paths, we came up with this. Well, Aaron named this concept of an AA, which is um, a way to deterministically, reliably address uh, one of your transitive dependencies via the um, walking the names, walking the names of the dependencies in each the... packet. The more official term is uh, canonical name for a package. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, cool. We'll use that going forward. Canonical name. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Not colloquial, but canonical name. Yes. <laughs> <That's cute. laughs> 
All right. Uh, well. Yeah, and I'll and I'll part I'll part with this thought. Maybe you all can join. I know it's not a thing, but maybe if we all agree that it can be a thing, let's call this method that takes two absolute paths and gives you the relative path from the first to the second. Let's call that relate, since it produces a relative path. And relativize is really long, and that's really unnecessary, and it has the same root as relate. I have implemented a function called relative uh, relativify. Yeah, I, I, which is I awful. It's going to come up. <laughs> so I was just waiting for that to come up. <laughs> All right. Did you know that the if I suffix in English is the most compressed etymological root uh, etymological prefix in the English language? Is it's I it, it's the F Y in if I comes from Latin facere, which means to make. It's the same root as factory <laughs> or factotum <laughs> or factor. Anyhow. All right. All right. Next time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's go async on that. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe tomorrow for you, ZV. So <laughs> it's very late, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, take right. It's not that late. <laughs> I'll see y'all. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.